In this video we are going to learn how to represent graphs in computer science. This is very important as there are many interesting problems that it is convenient to model as graphs. For example, in a network of friendships, the vertices can represent persons and an edge between the vertices can represent the two persons are friends. We then can discuss questions such as are Tom and Jerry friends? Here, since there is no edge between Tom and Jerry, the answer is no. How many friends does Bob have? We see Tom is connected to Bob with an edge and also Jerry, so the answer is 2. What is the shortest path between Bob and Alice? There are two options of getting from Bob to Alice. One is marked in green and is to go via Tom and Joe, and the second marked with blue and it is to go via Jerry. So going via Jerry is the shortest path. Many other problems and questions can be answered using graphs, so it can be useful to be familiar with graphs and the representations that we'll see soon. Let's now define better what graphs we are going to model. First, our undirected graph, as the example we just saw. Here is another one for example. And second, our directed graphs. Here is a directed graph for example. Differently from undirected graphs, in directed graphs, edges have orientation. For example, when looking for a shortest path like we did before, we can't travel on an edge in the opposite direction. So in the directed graph here, for example, there is no path at all between 3 to 1. Both undirected and directed graphs we define as a pair of sets. V is a set of vertices. In the examples here, it is a set of 5 vertices, number from 1 to 5. And E is a set of edges. In the undirected graph, we use curly braces for edges, to specify that the order does not matter. While in edges in the directed graph we use parentheses to specify the order does matter. And for example we see here that the edge between 1 to 2 is included once in the edges of the undirected graph, but in the directed graph we have both 1, 2 and 2, 1 edges. Also note that the edge between 4 to 1 is written where 4 is on the left and 1 is on the right to match the edge direction. Ok, now we are ready to see how to represent a graph. There are two very common graph representations. We start with adjacency lists. Adjacency list representations includes an array, commonly named ADJ, as a shortcut for adjacency, where each entry belongs to a different vertex. And each entry refers to a list that contains all of the vertices that are adjacent to that vertex. To make it easier to understand, let's see two examples. Here is a directed graph for our first example. Let's see how its adjacency list representation will look like. We have an array of size 5 as the number of vertices, as each vertex should have a cell. We write the relevant vertex for each cell inside the array cell but really the content of the cell is a reference to the list and not the vertex number. Looking at vertex number 1, we see there are two edges coming out of it, two vertices 2 and 5, so in this case the adjacent list contains vertices 2 and 5. Vertex 2 is also the source of two edges, one to one and the second to three. Therefore, in its adjacency list, we'll have 1 and 3. Vertex 3 has no outgoing edges, so its adjacency list is empty. Vertex 4 has two outgoing edges, two vertex 1 and two vertex 5. Therefore, 1 and 5 are in its adjacency list. Lastly, vertex 5 has only one outgoing edge, two vertex 3, so vertex 3 is the only vertex in its adjacency list. 
An interesting observation is that the total number of least cells equals to the number of edges in the graph. Let's now go over an undirected graph for example. Now every edge that touches the vertex is added to its adjacency list, as there is no specific direction for the edge. Starting from vertex 1, we see it is connected to three vertices, 2, 4 and 5, so we add them to its adjacency list. Vertex 2 is connected to vertex 1 as well, since it is undirected graph, so 1 is also in its list, and it is also connected to 3. Vertex 3, as we see here, is connected to vertices 2 and 5, so we add them to its adjacency list. For vertex 4, the neighbors are 1 and 5. And lastly, for vertex 5, the neighbors are 1, 4 and 3. An interesting observation here is that the total number of list cells equals to twice the number of edges. This is the case since there are no self loops in these graphs. The second common way to represent the graph is adjacency matrix. In this representation we have a matrix where the number of rows and the number of columns is as the number of vertices, such that each cell represents a possible edge between two vertices. If there is one inside a matrix cell at row i and column j, it means that there is an edge between vertex i to vertex j, and if there is zero, it means there is no edge. Let's build the adjacency matrix representation for the same two graphs we just saw when talking about adjacency list. Here is the directed graph. We start with an empty matrix and write the vertices numbered above the columns and to the left of the rows. First, we see there is no self loops between vertex 1 to itself, so we can write 0 in the first cell, and same for all other vertices, so we can fill the main diagonal with zeros. Here we have an edge between vertex 1 to vertex 2, so we write 1 in the corresponding cell. We see there is no edge between 1 to 3, so we write 0 in the corresponding cell. There is also no edge between 1 to 4, since the direction of the edge between them is on the opposite direction, so we write here 0 as well. Here we see there is an edge between 1 to 5, so we write 1. Now let's enter vertex number 2. We see it has an edge to vertex 1 so we write 1 in the first cell. We also see it has an edge to vertex 3, so we write 1 as well in the right cell. There are no more outgoing edges from vertex 2, so we can fill the rest of the row with zeros. Looking at vertex number 3, we see it doesn't have any outgoing edges, so we can fill the third row with zeros. Moving to vertex 4, we see it has two outgoing edges, to vertices 1 and 5, so we write 1 in the corresponding cells and zeros in the other cells in the fourth row. Lastly, vertex 5 has only one outgoing edge, to vertex 3, so we write 1 in the matching cell and 0 in all of the other cells on the fifth row. And we're done with the directed graph example. Now let's build the adjacency matrix for the undirected graph. We start again with an empty matrix where the number of rows and the number of columns is the same as the vertices number. In this graph we also don't have any self loops, so the main diagonal of the matrix will be filled with zeros. Let's this time go over all of the edges one by one, rather than on the vertices. We start with this edge between 1 and 2. Since now the graph is undirected, we write 1 in two cells, 
One represents the direction from 1 to 2, and the second represents the direction from 2 to 1. We continue with this edge between 2 to 3, and we write 1 in the cells that match both directions of the edge. And similarly, for this edge between 1 to 4, we write 1 both in cell 1, 4 and in cell 4, 1. Here we have an edge between 4 and 5, so we write 1 in cells 4, 5 and 5, 4. And the same for this edge between 1 to 5, which we write 1 for in cells 1, 5 and 5, 1. Lastly, we have the edge between 5 to 3, which we write 1 for in cells 3, 5 and 5, 3. Now that we covered all edges in the graph, we can fill the rest of the cells with zeros, as there are no more edges. It is important to pay attention that the matrix we've ended up with for undirected graph is symmetric above and below the main diagonal. Alright, we saw the two common ways to represent graph. Now let's compare them. Here we have the directed graph we saw before, with its adjacency list and adjacency matrix representations. Let's compare future characteristics of them. First, what does it take to find if an edge exists on each of the representations? If, for example, we want to check if there is an edge between 1 to 5, in the adjacency list representations, we need to go over the adjacency list of vertex number 1. In the worst case, we need to go over the entire list. The time complexity of this is big O of the number of neighbors that vertex 1 has. In the adjacency matrix, we can directly check the 1, 5 cell to see if there's an edge, which is big O of 1. So it is faster on the adjacency matrix. Let's say now we want to iterate over the neighbors of a vertex, for example to do something for each vertex. This is very common in graphs problem, for example to print all of the neighbors of a given vertex. In the adjacency list, we just need to iterate over the list of neighbors for that vertex. The time complexity of this is same as before, which is big O of the number of neighbors. In the adjacency matrix representation, we need to go over the entire row and find all of the ones in that row, but we also go over the zeros in order to find them. So in this case, the time complexity is big O of the number of vertices, V. In this case, the adjacency list is faster. Lastly, let's discuss the allocated memory each representation requires. In the adjacency list, we need to allocate the array in the size of the number of vertices, V, and the list. We saw before that the total number of list cells equals to the number of edges, E. So this is the big O amount of memory we'll need. In total, we get big O of V plus E. If we will talk about undirected graphs, the big O notation is the same. As in the worst case, we would multiply the number of list cells by 2, which doesn't change the big O notation. For the adjacency matrix, we simply need to allocate the matrix, which is the number of vertices squared, so it costs big O of V squared. So adjacency lists are more efficient here, unless the graph is very dense with edges. Lastly, let's see how we can extend the representations to support weights on edges, as this is very common in various graphs problems. We have here again our directed graphs with the adjacency list and adjacency matrix representations. If we would want to change it to graph with weights, it would look something like the following. Say we want to add weight of 8 to the edge between 2 to 3. 
In the adjacent matrix, we can replace the 1 in the 2, 3 cell to 8, specifying this is the weight. It is important to know that we need to handle the case where we have a zero weight. How will we know if we have an edge with weight 0 or no edge at all? A possible solution is to use null for specifying there is no edge, and zero for an edge with a weight. What about the adjacency lists? Here a possible way to support weights is to save the weight on the list cell, together with the vertex number. Know that in both cases, there are more options to extend the representations, that can be preferred dependent on the problem that you want to solve, and on the programming language that you are working with. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.